Welcome to Recovery at Cokesbury. My name's Terry. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I struggle with codependency. We're so glad you decided to join us. We want you to know a few things about who we are, what we do, and why we're here. We love Jesus and we've seen Him work miracles. You can be the next miracle. This is a safe place to learn, share, and ask questions. Recovery at Cokesbury is for anyone dealing with chemical addiction, compulsive behavior, loss, relationship issues, or life challenges. Scripture is the foundation for our teaching. The 12 steps are based on Scripture and our daily tools for recovery. We encourage participation with AA, NA, and Al-Anon. We want to encourage you to be part of Recovery at Cokesbury at Cokesbury Church on Thursday nights. The address is 9915 Kingston Pike in Knoxville, Tennessee. Dinner starts at 5.30, followed by large group worship and learning at 6.30. Open share groups meet at 7.45. True change and healing begin in those open share groups. For information about the groups we offer, please keep an eye on our website, recoveryatcokesbury.com. Thanks for joining us. We're confident you made the right decision. You will be understood, respected, and loved here.
Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, that our lives had become unmanageable. I see there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the brokenness that is still within me. Romans 7, 23. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. When we were powerless to help ourselves, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. We are daily delivered from brokenness and strongholds through life with Jesus. Romans 5, 6, and 10. Step three, we made a decision to turn our will and life over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you in the view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12, 1. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us test and examine our ways and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 340. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Confess to one another your faults, your slips, your false steps and your offenses and pray also for one another that you may be healed. James 5.16. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Change your mind and purpose. Turn around and return to God that your sins may be erased, blotted out and wiped clean. Acts 3.19. Step seven, we humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. If we confess our sins to God, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Step eight, we had made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything wicked or hurtful in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Psalms 139, 23, 24. Step nine, we may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that someone has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother or sister, then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23, 24. Step 10, we continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Romans 12, two. Step 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more deeply, intimately and fully and continue to enjoy your favor. Exodus 33, 13 and step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. My dear friends, if you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off, go after them, get them back and you will have rescued precious lives from destruction and prevented an epidemic of wandering away from God. James 5, 19, 20. Let's pray together. Sweet Jesus, we thank you so much for this room and for the opportunity to be free and the opportunity for you to work on our hearts 
and for you to give us new ones. And tonight our work is to figure out whether we, whether we trust you with our hearts. Jesus, in your sweet name we pray, amen. So step seven, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. You know, dealing with the sixth step, which says, became willing, became willing to let God do this work on our hearts. Seventh step is, I ask God to do it. You know, there's a willingness step and an action step. This is the action step. I talked last week about what are some of the liabilities of God going to work on my character defects? What are some of the liabilities of God going to work on my shortcomings? Why is it that this is important? Well, it's important because shortcomings always will be, be shortcomings untouched always will become resentments. You follow that? Like shortcomings are always gonna develop resentments. Resentments are always gonna be fuel for relapse. Resentments and sobriety, they're not friends of each other in any way. Probably the biggest fuel for, um, for the absence of sobriety, probably resentments. And so now we're asking for God to go to work as a surgeon on the fuel of my resentments, really. I talked about last week also that one of the questions about becoming entirely ready for God to do this work is the truth about me that do I see, like some, if you wanna do this, it's an interesting piece of work, um, recovery work is, write down what you, you know, I gave you a big list of, um, and you can find one anywhere online, but I, I gave you a big, huge list of character defects. We talked about, remember the main ones last week, and then we had like hundreds more, and you can find lists which close to a thousand. And that's important because our stuff's gonna be on there, right? You're not gonna be able to like, you're not gonna be able to like look at a, at a, look at a character defects list and go, you know what, I'm good because like none of mine are on there. It's like, oh yeah, they'll be on there. They're so dang long, they'll be on there. They're all very, comp you know, they're very comprehensive lists. It'll be on there. And we talked about the fact that one of the reasons that most of us struggle with the idea of God working on our character defects is that like for us, it wouldn't be a sustaining character defect if there wasn't some enjoyment or payoff for us. Am I right? You know, like there's a payoff to some of the stuff that's keeping us sick. There's a payoff to some stuff that keeps us out of sobriety. You know, like take, for example, um, one of the, uh, you know, the driver, what is the driver of the character defect of arrogance? You know, what is the driver of the character defect of pride? Well, the driver of pride and arrogance is going to be fear. Like, I'm afraid that if I'm standing as an equal with you, somehow I'm not gonna match up to you, right? So therefore, I gotta put on clothes, I gotta put on my arrogant jacket, I gotta put on my pride jacket in order to be able to handle the fact that I am afraid that I'm less than you. You know, all you gotta, all you gotta do to see that experience in the church is... Um, go have a conversation with four or five pastors um, the week after Easter, right? And so they go, well, how many people did you have at your church? Because they're gonna ask this question. It's, a dumb, it's kind of a dumb question. We ought, to ask, we ought to ask the question on like July the 16th or whatever. But no, we gotta ask at Easter. It's like, well, it's dumb because like, look, half the world's gonna go to church on Easter. It's like a social event. You know what I mean? Like you get a new hat, you get all the things, like then you just go, right? You go because you go. So here you could have five pastors, take five pastors, pick any five you want. How many people came to your church? Well, I mean, now remember these churches, the average Sunday for this church is 200. 7,000 came to my church. It's like, look at man, they couldn't even fit in your freaking parking lot of your building, not if you had 20 services, 7,000. Oh, well, how many came to your church? He goes, well, he just said 7,000. 27,000 came to my church. It's like, we got so many issues here. Issue number one, it never was your church. 
This belongs to Jesus, amen? This does not belong to any pastor. You're just working here. This belongs to Jesus. The church of Jesus has always been the church of Jesus, has always belonged to Jesus, and always will belong to Jesus because we're afraid of the fact that Pastor A over here might look more shiny than me. I'm gonna say 27,000 people or whatever came to my church, right? It's the person that you know that absolutely has to put somebody else down to build themselves up. You know people like that? They just gotta do it. They can't, you go to Thanksgiving dinner, you make a really good, you make a really good um, pumpkin pie. Or like, I wish you would also make some really good deviled eggs if I'm gonna go there. But you, you, make a really, you make a really good pumpkin pie, maybe you make some killer deviled eggs. But your Aunt Susie can't just say, well, I mean, Mark, you know, you made a really, that's a really good pumpkin pie. Like in my case, it would only be that good because if I went to freaking Costco and got it and brought it home, that it might be good. But you know, like even that, I mean, that's pretty good pie. That Costco is pretty good pie. But she couldn't say that was a really good pie, Mark. She has to say, well, you know, that was, that was pretty good pie. But I mean, like when I, when I make pie, I do this and this to the crust and I put a little, some kind of cinnamon on top, or I don't know what I did, I use this kind of, I don't just use like, like regular like whipped cream that you, know, you shoot around, I don't I gotta make like real whipping cream with some kind of French milk, or I don't know what stupid it is, like you got all of it at Whole Earth or somewhere stupid, but you know, you couldn't get it at just Costco, they don't even have the stuff at Costco, right? But they can't say to you, it was a great pie and just enjoy it and enjoy you and lift you up for the life of them. Do you know people like this? They can't do it. Like they gotta one up everything about you, right? And you know they're gonna do it, right? And they're predictable as all get out. Because why is that? As soon as you realize the driver of that kind of arrogance or pridefulness is fear, it really changes the game, doesn't it? Because you're like, I'm listening to someone who's afraid. I'm listening to someone who's afraid. I used to, you know, in another life, um, I sold stuff. And I mean, you know, like, the thing about selling is, I really do believe this, the more interested you are in what you do not know, and the more interested you are in having other salespeople on your team teach you stuff you don't know, and the more interested you are in having your client teach you what you don't know, right, about their business, the better you're actually gonna do. The more you come off to a client, the fact that you are just intractable, you know have all the answers, you never go, that's a really good question, let me go work on that a while. Even if you don't have an answer, you make one up, right, that whole deal. I'm telling you, you'll do five times better if you just tell people, you know what, that's a really good question. I don't have the answer to that question today, but I'm gonna go get it for you. I don't know that, or would, you, or would you teach me about that? Would you show me what that's really all about? Would you turn me on to what that's really all about? Because I have a humility about me that says, not only do I want to learn new stuff, but I should learn new stuff. Character defect of pride says, no, I'm afraid to learn new stuff because if I try to learn new stuff, it's gonna make me look inadequate. Well, someone who's more secure is gonna go, no, it's not gonna make me look inadequate. It's gonna make me look, it's gonna make me look honest, right? It's gonna make me look available. It's like going, it's like listening to new parents, you know, and new parents are forever gonna, they're gonna go, man. And of course, of course, um, if they read enough, there's someone in my family, someone that um, I parented who shall remain nameless, but to date, she's read 781 billion mommy blogs. She bought her newest car based on a freaking mommy blog review of SUVs. I kid you not, like she's a mom, she, I don't even have a group for that, man. I mean like this, it's just unbelievable stuff that comes out of the mommy blog. It's like, 
you know, you're like far, you want to say, I was just there, I just saw the, um, we were just there Sundays with trick-or-treating with the boys, my two grandsons, and so like, I, we didn't have too much mommy blog conversation that night because we went out trick-or-treating and it looked like pirates. It's hard to have mommy blog conversations when you're dressed up like a freaking pirate, you know what I mean? So like, there's that. But I tell you, man, it's like to listen to the mommy blog thing, you, every time we go there, Carol goes, you would swear, when we get back in the car, she goes, you would swear that you and I had never, ever thought of how to raise a child. Like, we are completely, and I told her, maybe we really did suck that bad. I mean, that is possible. It is possible. But I mean, it's like, we are being educated on how to be a parent on a freaking mommy blog. I mean, like, it makes you feel like you've hit a new low, right? But the thing about it is like, that, that takes the whole thing to a whole new level because if, if 700 people on a blog say it's right, it must be right. You know, like in my, you know, growing, you know, us with children, it was like, uh, what, was the, what was the book? Dr. Dr. Spock, right? I mean, like, there was stuff that Dr. Spock thought that was just stupid. There's a lot of people in therapy now because of stuff Dr. Spock said. <laughs> Check it out. I'm telling you, man, it's like, who would ever think that God gave anybody natural ability to parent? What kind of concept is that? But we, we hang on to our character defects because we gain advantage from them, amen? We hang on to codependency because it provides us with what we believe is an emotional advantage in a situation that is overwhelming us. We deal, we hang on to our addictive behavior, compulsions, because we believe they are helping us soothe ourselves and manage feelings that we don't think we know how to manage any other way, right? This is what we do. And so when it comes to our character defects, if I like, if I go into, if I go into Publix and it's taking longer for me to get whatever it is I want, whatever food the mommy blog says to buy, then, and I'm, you know, raising 19,000 kinds of hell about how long it's taken, someone's gonna hop to and they're gonna do what I want, right? And I'm gonna go, there's an advantage. As opposed to going in there and, and asking for what you need and it takes 10 minutes and you stand around and you do something else for 10 minutes, you talk to somebody or you do whatever you do because you don't have the advantage. And sometimes humility means I just don't have the advantage right? And I say, it's better for me to be sober than it is for me to have the advantage. That's a question you really got to ask, isn't it? Is, is my character defect worth risking my sobriety? Emotional sobriety, relationship sobriety, drug and alcohol sobriety, you know, whatever it is, gambling sobriety, sex addiction sobriety, whatever it is, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Because there is an advantage to these defects. I want to read you the step seven prayer. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Jesus, taking on the form of a servant, emptied himself, emptied himself of himself. See, the seventh step is really an extension of the third step. Remember, we talked about the fact that um, when it first started AA, when it first started forming, before it was even called AA, they said there's six basic, start off with three, went to six right away, six basic things that are involved in recovery, six basic things. And dealing with character defects was one of those six basics and making amends was another. Why is that? Because they both produce resentments. They both produce resentments. Third step says, made a decision to turn my life and my will over to the care of God, as I understand God. We get to step seven, God's like, Okay, are you ready? Like, now we're gonna turn over the stuff that has been giving you an advantage. Now we're gonna turn over stuff that's been working for you 
as you see it, but it's not been working in the favor of your sobriety. And how do we know that? Because like we cannot produce, we cannot produce our own sobriety. Amen. We are incapable of producing our own sobriety. Amen. It's just like going, well, I can, I can usher myself, I can usher myself into heaven by myself. It's like, how are you gonna do it? I'm gonna become a good person. I'm gonna read the Bible. I'm gonna pray a lot. I'm gonna go to church. I'm gonna teach Sunday school. I'm gonna do whatever it is I do. Not gonna get it. Not gonna get it. You still got your nature. You still got the stuff inside it that's completely broken. Well, what's it gonna take for me to be able to you know, have this eternal life with God? Well, it's gonna take God. It's gonna take Jesus bringing you into the waters and bringing you down with the waters with him and having the you that is you die, and he's gonna raise you up, breathe new breath into you, and give you an entirely new life, amen? Sobriety is the same way as what I'm talking about in Romans 6, exact same process. You can't, you can't knowledge yourself into becoming sober. You can't think your way into becoming sober. It's a transformational experience where Jesus takes a hold of you and puts you into that same water and the you that is you dies, step three, and he raises you up as an entirely new you, amen? And that starts in that third step, even though you're like, well, I didn't know all that was involved. I just thought that sounded like a good idea. Turn my life over to God. Why not? I'm not doing a good job of it. That's where most of us are when we get to step three, amen? Why not turn it over to God? Because when we first hear step three, it doesn't sound like it's costing us anything. Now we get to step seven. <laughs> it's gonna cost us a lot. It's gonna cost us our go-tos. It's gonna cost us our go-tos. It's gonna cost us our shtick. It's gonna cost us the thing that we rely on. It's gonna cost us the thing that, that works for us. It's kind of like a parent going, well, you know, daddy, can we go to, can we go to Dollywood this weekend? And the dad goes, we'll see. Seven years later, the kid knows we'll see is code for what? No. As opposed to going, well, honey, I gotta do these four things. If I can get them all done, I'd love to be able to go. You just, you just gave away your character defect of control for honesty with your child, right? That's what you did. The difference between step six and seven is, one is a thinking step and a willingness step, one is an action step. The difference between thinking and doing in the seventh step, when I go, God, okay, go to work on me, God does become the surgeon. And there, every piece of surgery, every piece of surgery matches up with what this step is really all about, doesn't it? There's a pre-surgical piece. The pre-surgical piece and signing the release is the sixth step. Then there's the surgery itself. Do you have trust in the surgeon that is gonna work with you? Do you trust them? And then there's gonna be the post-surgical piece, right? Where you're gonna have, it's gonna require a lot of care because you're gonna be lost and you're gonna be weakened and you're not gonna be sure about what to do without some of your go-tos. And then there's gonna be the rehab step where you gotta to learn to live a different way and you gotta trust other people. And you're gonna to have to talk to other people in the fellowship about the fact that, man, this is really awkward. I used to do A, B, and C, and now I'm not. I used to manage this guy in my relationship with him this way, and now I'm not doing that, and I feel lost. I used to manage my wife or my girlfriend this way, and now I'm not doing that, and I don't really know what to do. I used to be this kind of a parent, and now I'm doing it this way, and I don't really know what to do. Usually all those have to do with this lovely thing called rigorous honesty. And all along, God is like, I removed these defects from you in order for them not to become more than that, a deeper shortcoming, and eventually, a resentment or eventually a relapse fire. This step is all about humility, isn't it? I do have stuff in my life that is making me sick. I have relied on the things that have kept me sick for a while. 
I no longer want to rely on the things that are keeping me sick to live my life because I realize they're keeping me bound up. They're keeping me emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically in prison. I realize that only God can remove those from me. I realize that God is gonna provide me with sobriety in my life, right? Not me, not my knowledge. It's gonna be God that's gonna work on my broken heart. In step seven, it says, we begin to understand the meaning of humility. We practice this principle today by continuing to let go of status seeking and thoughts and actions by which we belittled ourselves and others and to humbly trust God for the removal of our shortcomings. That's the OA 12 and 12 second edition book. Here's more. Humility is simply awareness and willingness. I thought humility was something so different. I thought humility was something you either had as a character asset or you didn't. And certainly I didn't. Now I see as I surrender in step three, not a one-time surrender, but a daily surrender, God gradually and graciously teaches me and gives me a growing awareness, a growing as needed willingness and a corresponding, slowly expanding capacity for humility. It's about progress, not perfection. That's from the OA Lifeline. We talked about last week being entirely ready for this surgery. Am I, I ask you, are you entirely ready for life in the desert? Are you entirely ready to have God ra you know, raise you up to become this different woman or this different man and having to learn a new way to walk, think, feel, make decisions, all of that. Are you willing to be lost for a while? Are you willing to rely on other people like a sponsor, a sponsor who are gonna help you get through that large piece of transition? Because it's right about here in these steps, right here, really, I, th I think, starting with the fourth step, you're realizing what? This is not a program of recovery that you do by yourself, amen? This is not a program of recovery that you do by yourself. It's not that. Am I ready for this place of going to the wilderness for a while in my life and being unsure of what's happening? Am I ready to hear the truth about what God is saying to me? We talked about those pieces last week, deeply loved. Can I understand that about myself? How hard is it because that might be one of my character defects is, is that one of my character defects might be that I'm unbelievably self-destructive, right? I just have a history of being self-destructive. And when someone says to you, show me on a timeline your life, and you go, well, I blew my life up here. Well, I blew my life up three years later. Well, this happened to me over here, right? I got fired over here. I started college and quit after three years here. I did this over here. Um, this happened to me over here. I got married and divorced over here. And someone goes, you look at this timeline. What is this, pa what is this pattern of self-destruction all about in your life? And you go, you know what? I don't, I don't really know. That, that is just the way I am. Like I'm just one big defect. And so then you go, well, what happens when God goes into your life and you're willing to let God be this surgeon and God removes that self-destruction tape from your head, wherever you got it, and he replaces it with a tape that says, you know, you're beloved, you're deeply loved, you're completely forgiven, you're fully pleasing to me, you're totally accepted. You may have to hear that a thousand times because in take a while, you're gonna be lost. If you come out of a deeply self-destructive life, you're gonna be lost, man, when God removes that from you. Because we, we've learned, if that's you, we, you've learned how to live with that tape, 
right? You've learned how to adjust to it. You've learned how to function with that kind of negative self-talk. And God takes that away because you asked him to. And he replaces this with his loving voice. And what are you gonna do with this loving voice? What are you gonna do with the loving voice of Jesus that comes off the cross for you? Deeply loved, completely forgiven, fully pleasing, totally accepted. Those are the words you're gonna hear when you end up finding yourself in that desert. Micah 6, 8 says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what is God asking of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's it. That's what the new life is, right? That's what walking around with God is. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Takes us back to the garden. Adam, let's go for a walk. Adam, he realized there was nothing he needed to do in that garden more important than taking a walk with God. Same thing happened to Eve. Let's go for a walk. How long was it from that first time they walked with God to the next time they walked with God. How long was it? For some of us, it's been 30 years. We have felt defective for 30 years. We have felt incomplete for 30 years. We have felt worthless for 30 years. We've been angry for 30 years. We've been manipulative for forever. And now we ask God to be our surgeon. And we go, take it away, God. Create in me a new heart. Show me an entirely new, free way to live. And that's where you gotta have the fellowship going. Here, let me shine the light. Let me shine the light and show you the way to go. And this is a big this is a big, big step. I think, I think it has more to do with freedom than probably anything we've talked about so far. And there's bits of freedom in every one of these steps, obviously, but man, what kind of freedom step is this? Sweet Jesus, thank you for this time together and for speaking into us and for being our willing surgeon. Show us what it's like to be free. In your sweet name, amen. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right, if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him in the next. Amen.